Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's show. Uh, my name is Seth Colliner. I'm the Editorial Director at VentureBeat. Um, welcome to the Asia Society's Business Panel. We're here today to talk about uh, the pandemic and artificial intelligence and where they intersect. Um, we're gonna meet the panelists in just a moment here. Um, but first, I'm gonna just say a few things about AI in general for those who are, are somewhat unfamiliar. Um, so we're here to discuss and learn about how the evolution of artificial intelligence intersects with the global pandemic. Before the pandemic, we'd already been well into an AI summer meaning where AI was growing rapidly in terms of research, funding, innovation, and even applications. Um, and now uh, the pandemic has changed a lot about the world of AI, but it, it actually hasn't slowed things down. Um, and so I wanna briefly explain uh, what AI even is, um, but in fact, it's easier to describe it by explaining what it isn't. Um, it isn't sentient. Um, the science fiction tropes of robot uprisings are indeed still a fiction. Uh, and likely will always remain a fiction. Um, sentience is artificial general intelligence or AGI. Uh, and experts agree that AGI is at least decades away and, and may never exist at all. Um, so when we say AI today, we're basically talking about advanced computer algorithms that can perform specific tasks much faster than humans and at a far greater scale and complexity than humans can manage. So for example, um, computer vision is AI that enables self-driving vehicles and it recognizes your face in a photo among other things. Natural language processing or NLP uh, enables predictive text and it powers the customer service chatbots you've no doubt engaged with many times. Robotic process aut automation or RPA is ideal for performing mundane, repetitive knowledge worker sorts of tasks and so on and so on and so on. Um, you'll note those are actually quite narrow tasks. Um, and, and again, that's where today's AI really shines. So for instance, it's impressive that an autonomous vehicle can drive itself down a busy street, but it can't tell a joke. It can't make a cup of coffee. It can't tie shoelaces, right? There are a million things that humans who possess vast amounts of general intelligence can do that AI just can't. So what's exciting is when we have AI that can do things that humans can't or can do them better and faster. Now, even though we have nothing to fear from sentient robot overlords, AI does prevent, uh, present many potential dangers that we really can't overlook or minimize. Um, and ironically, these dangers come primarily from humans and our biases. So data is the fuel for all AI, but data can be biased, can be incomplete, corrupt, poorly sampled, and so on. And the machine learning models that we make can be biased by design. Uh, and even the very problems or questions that we seek to solve with AI may be dangerous wrong questions, um, such as trying to predict recidivism by using computer vision to look at inmates' faces, uh, which is just modern day phrenology. Um, humans encode their biases in what they make. And without proper scrutiny, when you create AI, you not only encode those biases, but you amplify them. And in recent years, we've seen this all over the place from predictive policing and hiring practices and dealing with medical patients and on and on and on. We could spend days here unpacking all those issues, but here's the key takeaway that you really should know. When it comes to AI, ethics and efficacy are inextricably linked. If you don't take great care to address your approach, your data and your model design and output, your AI doesn't work. Uh, but AI is being used successfully all over the world for all sorts of applications right now. Um, and it's growing and changing and evolving all the time. And that's very exciting. Um, so we're going to start our conversation now and uh, let's meet our panelists. And I'm just going to um, start by um, pointing a finger at one of you. And I would like for each of you to just uh, say who you are, uh, uh, what you do and how you came to AI. Um, Navrina, can we start with you? Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm Navrina Singh. I'm the founder and CEO of Credo AI. We are a very early stage startup that is tackling one of the most important issues of our time, uh, focused on AI auditability and governance. I've been in tech now for almost two decades, building products at companies like Qualcomm and Microsoft, um, helped create the robotics division within the company at Qualcomm. And that was my foray into uh, artificial intelligence almost a decade back. Uh, I'm also a young global leader with World Economic Forum and sat on their Council of AI and was uh, really 
privilege to participate in conversations around AI regulations and strategies across the world, especially in Canada, Singapore, uh, and European Commission. In addition, I am a board member at Mozilla Foundation, where we are trans transitioning from this whole concept of over open internet uh, to trustworthy internet. And being part of that journey has just been incredible. Um, looking forward to sharing more today and I'll hand it over to Jeff Wong. Great, thanks Narina, thanks Seth. Uh, so Jeff Wong, I'm the Global Chief Innovation Officer at EY. Uh, EY is a 300,000 person professional services firm in every major country, pretty much every major city of the, in the world. Uh, my background is actually venture capital, growth tech investing, and then spending about a decade on the internet. Um, and my job here though, has been about creating new things for us. So that's whether that's new services that we wanna be in or looking at the things we've done for a long time in a new way. Um, as a part of that, uh, to your question, Seth, I, I own the global advanced tech groups. So that's in artificial intelligence as well as blockchain. And so we've done a lot of sort of interesting things there from an enterprise level AI application. That's great. I'm gonna go along the top of my screen here. Ernestine, can you introduce, introduce yourself? Sounds great. Thanks for having me. My name is Ernestine Fu. I've been an investor at a venture capital fund called El Sopoli Partners since 2011, focused on cybersecurity, enterprise, um, frontier tech, emerging technologies, and of course, AI is common within um, a lot of our portfolio companies. I'm also an adjunct professor at Stanford, focused on teaching a class on frontier technologies, um, emerging technologies, and its impact on society. So excited to be here. Um, I'll turn it over to our last panelist to introduce himself. Hi, thank you, Ernestine. I'm Phil Howard. I'm director of the Oxford Internet Institute, and I'm chair of the Oxford Commission on AI and Good Governance. Our, our project involves figuring out how we would want government to use AI. So we start from the assumption that there are many, many guidelines on what ethical AI looks like, um, but that a lot of governments need guidance on how to actually implement the AI systems they have now. Um, and so this is, this is much more about the next two to five years than it is about trolley problems in the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Very good, thank you. Um, and so I'm gonna start diving into some questions here. Um, so I wanna kind of get, just start with a big picture here. Whereas we're looking at global impacts. So I'd just like to hear from each of you in turn, um, where you have seen from your corner of the world, from your corner of the AI industry, where you've seen the greatest impact at the intersection of AI and the pandemic. And, and Ernestine, why don't we start with you? Um, sounds great. Well, um, I think the pandemic has definitely become a forcing function um, for us to think about new and emerging ways to use technology. So I guess with AI specifically, we've seen um, countries focus on detecting fever in large crowds using AI. So being able to check hundreds of people within a few minutes without making contact um, to see who has high temperature levels, which might be a sign that they also have COVID. Um, we've also seen, for instance, medical testing, such as x-ray screening and using AI to highlight any abnormalities in the lung, for instance. And that's been able to um, provide doctors with a much faster um, response time in terms of an individual's risk to COVID. Um, other instances have been even just using AI-based robots like drones um, to perform contactless delivery or to automatically spray um, disinfectants in public areas. And then of course, I think probably the most common use of AI we've seen that's been very effective is contact tracing via smartphones and using AI to um, track and flag possible carriers of the virus um, we saw that being deployed all around the world um, with some concerns around um, privacy as well with all of these use cases. But I think we've definitely seen the use of AI in, um, in many instances to try to uh, fight COVID, so. That's great, yeah. Um, Navrina, could you weigh in? Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting because I, you know, I've been in this field for now two decades and uh, we were already on this amazing digital transformation journey and suddenly we felt like there was the spike that happened, which is COVID. And uh, we did expect the digital transformation to accelerate even further uh, to so much so as 10X. Uh, but what has been really fascinating for us, uh, especially at Credo AI, 
is to see how every industry, whether it is CPG, manufacturing, logistics, uh, high tech, uh, financial systems, pharma, healthcare, suddenly in the past year, you know, not only the AI first companies, but the massive middle, which was a tech forward, have started to adopt uh, new ways of interacting with their customers, new ways of uh, really bringing their employees online and enabling new interactions, especially in this remote uh, world. So what we have noticed is there was already this you know, gathering of data and reasoning over that data. As Seth mentioned, that's basically what machine learning and AI is. But what did, we didn't expect was how COVID is going to transform uh, basically the new ways of thinking about machine learning models. The historical data, the historical context sort of is falling short. And because of COVID, what's happened is there's new data, uh, new patterns that are emerging. So what has been fascinating for us is not just the traditional industries, uh, all the ones that uh, Ernestine mentioned uh, that have been like sort of living on this data and reasoning over that data, but also thinking about when you have not seen those traditional patterns in the data in the past 10 years, 15 years, what are new methodologies you should be using? Now, I'll give you an example. We work very closely with the financial and the banking industry. And as you can imagine, whether it is risk scoring, underwriting, or marketing solutions, they are using a lot of credit card transactions to really figure out uh, you know, what should be the risk score associated with an end customer. Now, that basic uh, you know, decision-making system has looked at historical data where there was no COVID. And now suddenly when you see a pandemic completely disrupting our lifestyles, the way we are purchasing goods, the way we are uh, you know, transacting online, that is basically changing how these models now make decisions. So what has been fascinating for us is not just the um, aggressiveness with which companies are digitally transforming and leveraging more of these machine learning technologies, but also how they have to sort of reset their expectations because the older historical data patterns don't really match the new reality of the pandemic. And happy to dive deeper into how uh, you know, that is playing a massive role in the ethics and the governance of multiple of these technologies. It's interesting you, you mentioned the, the disruption in the data, right? Because um, so much of AI is just this fancy pat pattern matching, right? And, and yeah, it's completely, completely disrupted. We can't really trust the, so much of the historical data. Uh, it's quite disruptive. Uh, uh, Jeff, why don't we move on to, to you? Yeah, no, just I wanted to reflect on and build on the, the Ernestine Navrina, Navrina's uh, comments. So yeah, so for us, the, to your original question, Seth, you know, we, we've helped governments and government-like entities around the world help, or at least early on, predict the spread, you know, try to model out and predict the spread of COVID and sort of participate that way. In a more simplistic example, um, we also did a series of, of the chatbot uh, technologies that had to all be spun up COVID specific because the demand for what's going on and what's the information we need just spiked around that time frame. So we worked with a lot of mega healthcare medical systems around that. Um, so you know, what, what is fascinating is Ernestine gave a series of examples, but it is really widespread, right? The, the use of this technology against uh, COVID is very, very widespread. I think Ernestine gave uh, several fantastic examples of that. But Irina, what you said also was particularly important, at least from what we've seen, not just from the surveys. So the surveys you see are, you know, 80% of companies have accelerated the digital transformation. 30% uh, of companies have actually accelerated their specifically their AI investments. Um, we are on the positive side of each of those surveys and we've seen it in our client leading, the leading firms in our client base as well. And what you recognize is everything is accelerated significantly with COVID. So uh, probably something that this audience is well attuned to. Um, but what they're also seeing is in particular with AI is the fact that there's actual financial return right now from this technology. Um, some of the stats for us in, in our personalized experiences, we have, you know, we, we, we read documents for the enterprise because that's what we're particularly good at. That's where we have a data advantage. You know, our, that's probably about 500% better than the way we used to do it because of uh, AI technologies that we implied, which, which for us leads to a nine figure revenue um, over the next 18 months, positive impact, right? So when you start to get to numbers like that uh, against 
um, this technology and the application of this uh, of AI. That's also why I think you're seeing these accelerations, particularly this environment. Uh, it's not just because it's cool or neat or it's a cool buzzword. It's because there's actual financial outcomes that people are seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. And uh, Phil, same question. And, and you know, one thing I that um, uh, I, I'm interested in myself is you know you have a slightly different perspective from being in a, on a different continent. Um, so uh, same same question, but I'm, I'm curious sure. if, um, if your location has any uh, has, has um, shaped your response at all. I, I think it I think it, it does. There's two things I'd offer. One is probably um, not good, and one is probably good. The first is that there's some pretty sophisticated machine learning applications around COVID misinformation, right? So spreading uh, content about what not to do or or evaluating the risks the wrong way. And this misinformation comes sort of packaged in very sophisticated ways with um, purposefully crafted faces on social media accounts. And sometimes the messaging is quite sophisticated and, and driven by um, sort of advanced machine learning Kits. And so that, that misinformation story is one of the bad things about uh, AI activity around COVID. One of the interesting things I've noticed in governments for governments outside the US context is that, that governments, um, especially in Europe, are really waking up to the power of data in a way they hadn't before. I think they'd sort of given lip service to open data, um, the promise of public, act, of public data you know, being used for, for creative applications. I think now a lot of government policymakers really get it because they can see how their national health services have responded well, poorly, or well, based on the quality of, of, of service data that the organizations have. And increasingly, policymakers are eager to find what they call low-risk AI applications. So the AI applic machine learning applications that really sh shouldn't drive controversy, where, where the quality of data is, is fit for purpose for the problem they're trying to solve. And that's one of the interesting outcomes, right? So we can't solve everything with AI, um, but there are some public problems we, the governments can solve if they make, make the right investments. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and Jeff, I'm going to start with you with this next question. It was open to everybody, though. I'd like to hear what everybody thinks. But um, you alluded to um, investments in AI. Um, and, uh, you know, why is investment in AI increasing now? And what has been the role of the ongoing pandemic in those decisions? Yeah, so I, I think we touched on it a little earlier. You, you touched on it, so calling it an AI summer even before the, the pandemic hit. And it was really true. AI was having an expansive investment uh, moment. Um, I think people were starting to see and experiment with a lot of the impacts before. I think that the, the pandemic really caused people to focus in on what was working and not working. Um, I, I know we did that internally for ourselves as well. What is actually driving revenues now? What should we be doubling down, down on in this environment? And I think that that was the remarkable moment for us. And I think for many of the companies we interact with that saw, hey, these interesting experiments we had, wow, the data coming out of it is pretty good. The, the results coming out of it are pretty good. In fact, good to great. We should probably double down on this, you know, in a constrained environment because that looks like what's going to drive impact for us. Um, and so what's really interesting is I think that has happened, which has caused a reimagination for a lot of C-suites around the world around what is possible for their companies. You know, it's it's funny because we saw this coming slowly before the pandemic, you know, the, the light bulb, the proverbial light bulb going off in, above people's heads saying like, wow, this is really different, interesting. And now inside the pandemic, we've seen this rapid acceleration. And Narina, you were right, it's across different industries that, you know, we perhaps wouldn't ex expect. We, we held a, uh, a big summit for, um, uh, online summit for our agricultural sector. And we had something like 200 C-suite, you know, CEOs, presidents of different agriculture uh, businesses, food system businesses around the world. So each layer of the value chain. And they're talking about, you know, how do we share data to make artificial intelligence useful in this, you know, and that's the agriculture business, which, which again, you know, people on this call perhaps wouldn't, wouldn't think of as the first group to raise their hand and say, wait, we need to really think about this differently. So we're seeing this across the board, across sector, uh, tends to be leading companies, you know, companies that have survived financially uh, reasonably well from the pandemic, but we're distinctly seeing that acceleration. 
Yeah, Ernest, do you, do you have any comments on that one? Mm -hmm. um, definitely agree with Jeff's comments in terms of companies really recognizing it as a way to reduce costs and also increase revenues. Um, it's interesting that you term it as um, investment in AI is increasing because um, from the VC perspective, my first investment about 10 years ago was in a company that had the word AI, that buzzword in its pitch deck. And I think we are seeing that in a lot of startups. But I think at the end of the day, AI is also making remarkable progress on solving a wide range of um, computer science problems. And I think that's why companies are also adopting it more and more. Um, I think of two examples um, in mind when it comes to just reducing costs and increasing revenues. Um, one, Amazon, a company that most of us are familiar with and use on a daily basis. A few years ago when they acquired for a little less than a billion dollars, a company called Kiva, that really reduced um, their costs, um, operating costs when it comes to automating picking and packing. So there's a concept of the click um, to ship cycle time. And previously with humans, that was around 60 to 75 minutes. Um, but then with Kiva, that reduced the time down to 15 minutes. So you can see that greatly reducing costs for Amazon. And then also Netflix, I'm sure we've all been binging on Netflix, um, especially during the pandemic and um, just the simple idea of having an AI algorithm to provide personalized recommendations um, really reduces the friction for users to have to find a movie or a TV show that they might wanna watch. Um, studies have shown that if it takes too long for someone to find a movie to watch, then they just cancel their subscription. So that's also helped Netflix in terms of um, helping customers find content and then also uh, reducing the likelihood of people canceling their subscriptions as well. Um, direct, um, you know, impact on revenue, so. Yeah, and Narina, you have a, a, a perspective from the other side of, of the investment coin. Um, you know, as someone who's running a company, I wonder what your perspective is on the same thing. Absolutely, you know, I just want to give you an example uh, that our consumption patterns have drastically shifted in the past year. Um, my six and a half year old now has her own Amazon Prime account. So now what Amazon is doing is understanding, you know, what is this new user looking to buy? So I get recommended a lot of wine, but for her, it's a lot of toys. So it's really fascinating to see that how, again, I keep going back to the historical context now is shifting so drastically because of the pandemic. Um, so companies like us, uh, we are focusing on a very slightly different problem. And I think this is more in line with, uh, Phil, what, what you're focused on is as these frontier technologies become pervasive, especially when you look across use cases, whether they are low impact or high impact, the level of scrutiny, oversight, or governance needed, it drastically shifts. But now we are moving into this world where it is not just a technology problem, it's a techno-social problem where we have to think about policies, we have to think about uh, data, we have to think about um, you know, who are the people who have the risk management capability that need to come into it? Um, so for us, what we have noticed is not only that there is this increase in adoption of machine learning, but also a higher focus being put on how do we govern and provide oversight to these technologies? And I'll give you two examples. Going back to the example, uh, I'll, I'll build off uh, Ernestine's uh, comment. Uh, you know, contactless uh, technology, be it facial recognition or voice recognition, has accelerated in the past year. And what we are finding is not only are the companies adopting them, but they are also intentionally pausing and thinking about it. Have we trained these technologies on demographically diverse data? Because if we haven't done that, guess what? We might be leaving an entire population out of these systems. So now the concern is not only about bringing these advanced technologies technologies into their organizations so that they can improve the customer experience, but it is also, can I improve the customer experience without exposing my organization to additional risk? And this is where Credo AI comes in, where we help organizations uh, sort of step back and look at, have you looked across all the bias characteristics? Are your systems fair? Uh, when you have internal compliance policies, 
are your ML systems actually adhering to those ML policies and, and the compliance policies? How do you create audit trail of decision making as to why did you decide to deploy a facial recognition system for access control in your building? Now that lot, not many people can show up in your buildings, but you need these facial recognition systems to allow a Phil or a Jeff to enter the building. But the question is, are these systems accurate enough, sophisticated enough, uh, not you know, they're, I wouldn't say bias free or fair, you know, completely fair, but what are some of the other implications? So what, what we are finding, uh, Seth, is not only the adoption of these technologies, but the intentionality that this multi-stakeholder ecosystem needs to build. And so we are seeing engagement from policymakers, we are seeing engagement from uh, compliance teams, audit teams. And that for me has been much more exciting to see in the past year and a half. And I think this is just the starting. We're going to see more in that space. If I might, um, Seth, jump in really quick on what yeah. Naveen was saying. You're absolutely right. We're, we're seeing, you know, as projects turn from fun experiments that were interesting and cool to, oh my gosh, this has got to be part of our infrastructure and how we move forward. I think you see companies waking up to the need for governance and making sure that it's an unbiased input and outcome. Um, but uh, Naveena, you touched on this, uh, governments, the regulators are, are rapidly waking up to the fact that these systems that are being used, how do, you, how do you figure out what's in them? And how do you figure out what's going in and coming out and whether or not it is, uh, whether there's bias or it's, it's a good answer? Right. Particularly, we, we exist in our biggest business is the assurance business, which is audits, and particularly in that business where if we use a tool like AI, we have to have a way to show that it is giving a good input and a good output, um, which is really difficult to do today. So, Naveen, your, your companies and companies like yours, technology is incredibly important to make this expand uh, even further than it has. Yeah, so we've touched a little bit on, on the policy issue, um, and I want to I want to um, hit on that a little bit more. And Phil, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a, a similar question with that in mind. So, you know, can, can you speak to how these AI investments have been different in terms of public policy across the world? So, and this is no oversimplification, but U.S. versus China versus Europe um, and other countries, there, there's been some big differences. I wonder if you can uh, elaborate on that a bit. Sure, I, I think there's some, some basic difference for the investment so far that you um, would logically anticipate. So the Chinese tend to invest in a wide, wide range of AI ML learnings, um, machine learning systems. Um, of the ones that are politically um, sensitive, this involves uh, facial recognition software. It involves um, infrastructure for the national security services. Um, tie-ins to the new uh, criminal laws run from Beijing and some, to some degree a response to uh, what's going on in Hong Kong, democracy movements there. Uh, Europe tends to think of AI as um, a mode for solving social problems where, wherever possible, but it's still trying to figure out what that means. And, and I think North America will, will get there soon. For the moment, the European policymakers think treat this as a real spectrum of possibilities, right? There's the possibility that we could use AI um, to offer a policymaker a little bit of help, right? The policymaker takes all the actions, makes all the decisions, um, but AI offers maybe a set of decision options and a set of action groups. There's the possibility that AI might go a little further, right? And narrow options would, would we want policymakers to have a narrow set of options where the narrowing was done by AI? Then there's the possibility that AI might be used to recommend one alternative to a policymaker. Um, the policymaker would still act, but, but machine learning would get us down to the best possible route of action. Then we start to get into areas where maybe the AI would act on a suggestion if the policymaker approves. Um, then there's the possibility that AI would be allowed to act, um, but give a restricted time to veto to a policymaker. So um, AI would, would in implement policy decisions. Uh, the policymaker would have a day or two of oversight. And if they don't catch anything, AI would proceed on its own. Then from there, it escalates, right? AI could act automatically on public policy questions, um, informing the policymaker after decisions have been taken, uh, or maybe informing the policymaker only if asked, or informing the policymaker 
only if the AI decides that the policymaker needs to be informed. Um, and then from there, you know, the other extreme is that AI takes most policy decisions, uh, acts autonomously and ignores the policymaker. Now, some of these scenarios are fanta seem fantastic, but some of them are on the horizon. And um, I think different kinds of governments have different value sets on where they want to be on that proposition of, of how much, uh, what kind of a role machine learning would have, particularly in, in democracies. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any other comments on that? But I, I do want to talk about um, privacy and data collection of governments in just a second. Any other comments on that specific question before we move to there? I would love to add um, a slightly different flavor to what Phil said. Uh, by the way, Phil, I, I, I love how you gave the different scenarios. And we are seeing that across, by the way, not just policymakers, but also in, in enterprise and consumer companies and the private sector, government sector, both included. Uh, one of the things for us to think about is you know, this whole notion of human oversight and, and how this human oversight is actually causing two great things to happen. The first thing it is causing is what we like to call as persona metamorphosis. Uh, what we are seeing is, uh, you know, the traditional, let's say, the auditors or the compliance managers, policymakers, um, for them to actually have an active role in this new set of frontier technologies there's this metamorphosis that they're going through where not only do they have to understand and, and bring their expertise to machine learning and AI, but in doing so, they're creating new categories of jobs, which it's been very fascinating for, for us to interact with as we are working with private and government sector. And this persona metamorphosis is, I think, an exciting thing that came out of this pandemic that we are gonna see emergence of new job categories like tech auditors, um, you know, like tech policymakers, et cetera, really emerge, which are at the intersection of tech and uh, a new job profile. And then the second thing that we are observing is this whole notion of human in the loop. Uh, totally agree that there are applications which like RPA, which are so low impact in many cases that you might not need any human intervention. Most of the applications right now have some sort of human in the loop but one of the things we are also seeing is this whole notion of that human is the loop, because especially in high impact scenarios, what is going to be so critical, and as Phil alluded to, that this human oversight becomes even more important in those scenarios. So for me, what's really exciting to see is when people talk about machine learning and how their jobs might be taken away, et cetera, actually we are not seeing that. What we are seeing is this amazing metamorphosis and this human is the loop concept uh, show up, which is causing multi-stakeholders from different expertise level coming in to not only design these technologies, develop these technologies, but deploy them at scale. And that actually is going to be the next frontier um, that I'm, I'm excited to see how ENY and others uh, tackle that challenge as well. So we're starting to touch on the international part a little bit, and I want to sort of uh, take some of the things we've talked about so far and, and continue in that uh, with that lens a little bit, um, because one of the big, big challenges um, has been around privacy, right? Um, and again, you know, AI is all about data um, and, and tracking and working on solving problems in the pandemic are have typically been very data heavy tasks, right? Um, but, you know, um, specifically and sort of also broadly in terms of different, the different governments at play here, how, how concerned should the public be about all the data that's being collected, collected by both companies um, and by governments? Uh, and, and Ernestine, we haven't heard from you a little bit. I'd like to start with you. Um, yeah, I think um, as individuals, we should definitely be concerned about the amount of data that's being collected. And I think different countries and regions are also taking different approaches. Um, so with Europe, obviously there's GDPR and um, some pretty aggressive restrictions on the type of data that companies can collect and also reporting mechanisms. Um, California and the United States um, is still pretty separate in terms of the approach. Um, so for California, obviously there's CCPA and Virginia is also passing similar regulations right now, while if we look at regions like China, for instance, um, facial recognition is just widely used without any sort of um, regulation. I think the pandemic has been an interesting question for governments to really be forced to ask um, if they should be increasing surveillance to help fight COVID. Um, obviously, in um, emergency pandemic-like cases, um, really lives can be saved if we increase surveillance, but the question I always have before we just immediately say yes to this is um, 
ratcheting up surveillance now just to combat a pandemic could also permanently open the doors to more invasive forms of snooping that it's just um, you know uncontrollable at that point. So even though several countries decided to um, track people's movements um, through contract tracing, which we briefly touched upon in order to fight the pandemic, at what point do we get to that scenario where any single time there's a pandemic or any sort of health crisis that we could just um, track people's data? So um, I think um, a lot of big questions that I don't have the answer to, but I think we should definitely be asking those. Yeah, is anyone else gonna weigh in on this one? I could offer some some thoughts because I do think it's it's an important a very a very important question for us as citizens. Um, I mean, at the moment, um, I think we've effectively lost the privacy war. Right? There's there's so much information about us that we can't reclaim. Don't know where it is. Uh, it's it's hard to to know who owns it. And I think there there are a number of governments around the world that are considering, especially in Europe, that are considering. Um, considering rules which would say that an AI application in public service must be able to demonstrate the complete provenance of the data that has trained it and is being used by it. And, and that might become one of the, for the commission anyway, that's one of the possible thresholds by which you would evaluate whether an AI application can be used at scale in a significant system. I think that would have, you know, it would have a cooling effect on a number of, uh, number of startups, a number of industries, but it would also set a basic threshold that if a company can't explain where all of its data came from, um, it shouldn't be developing machine learning systems for public service. If I could just add something to the to the comments uh, around this, Seth. You know, with you know, so different governments around the world have sort of less restrictive to more restrictive data policies, and I think it reflects a lot of that uh, cultural. Uh, aspects of those those constituencies, right? So I live in the United States, and so I personally have a very United States view of, of you know, lo liking privacy, wanting my privacy, et cetera. But I recognize other cultures and people have different um, tolerance levels for that. I, I think the one thing I would encourage, you know, if there are any government um, uh, leaders on the, on the call today um, to think about, though, is the implications from their policies, right? So a more restrictive policy will hamper the development of the algorithms and AI systems and tools for their companies, which may be um, may make it more challenging strategically or competitively for your companies to compete on a global scale later on. You know, areas of the world that are less restrictive about their data have more advanced models, right? And and I think that I haven't always seen government um, leaders be able to relate privacy considerations to the competitiveness of their companies on a global scale. And I think, you know, every, every government world needs to make their own decision. Every constituency needs to make their own decision about what's right. But my concern is simply that they aren't thinking it all the way through, right? If you are more restrictive, because that is what your constituent, that's, that's great. I have to have no problem with that, but you have to recognize that your company's in your in, in from your country may not be as competitive, you know, in in five, ten, or you know, maybe even fewer than five or ten years, because another company from another country in a less restrictive policy just has a better model, you know, better outcome, better better risk if you're an insurance company, better facial recognition if you're a facial recognition company, and just to be aware of that and cognizant of that going in, I think is is something I haven't seen as much of, and I would hope yeah. to see more of. Yeah, and holding that, holding on to that thread for a second, Irina, I want to, I want to ask a, a related question for you to, to kind of answer. This is very much where, where you spend a lot of your time thinking about these sort of things. And, and Jeff, I think what you touched on is that there's nuance here. Um, and, you know, I think too often in the, in the conversation about data and privacy, and especially among world governments, it's, it's a little too easy to see things in, in black and white, right? So people sometimes are, think it's either totally necessary, get out of the way, just get it done. Other people go all the way the other way, and this is a total overreach by the surveillance state, and it's completely unacceptable. Um, can you speak to some of the more, you know, the, new, the more nuanced situations? And Jeff kind of kind of brought that up a little bit, um, and, and maybe you can pick up that thread as as part of the answer. But these more nuanced situations, you know, where or how uh, data collection and the way it's being used is is maybe more of a positive thing than a harmful thing, or you know, where 
just where some of that tension lies. Yeah, you know, we are still scratching the surface. It's, uh, I'll talk about, you know, things that I agree with the panelists on. I totally agree with Phil that we've kind of lost the privacy war, um, but we still have uh, some new ways to tackle, especially around data provenance and other uh, auditability needs. I do agree with um, Jeff that, you know, if we regulate the, uh, some of these applications too extensively, it could prevent innovation. But I think intentional uh, policy making is absolutely critical at this time. So whenever we look at applications and we work with our customers, we really sort of try and divide it into, um, you know, what kind of data is being used? Where is that data coming from? Is it personal data versus is it an engagement data? Is it behavioral data versus is it attitudinal data? Because as you can imagine, based on these different layers of data, um, personal data is something that we should have control on. Uh, the customer should be able to consent to it. But at the same time, there's also the need for, you know, stronger GDPR, CCPA regulations, so that the service organizations are not just uh, out there crazily using our data without our consent. Um, so I think this is a, don't have an answer to it, but I think what is going to be needed, I keep going back to it, is we will need intentional policies and multi-stakeholder uh, conversations uh, to really understand what kind of data uh, does the user own? Uh, because at the end of the day, we are the ones who are powering these algorithms. We are the ones who are making businesses successful because they are reading our behavioral analytics and creating these recommender systems which serve us more of what we want. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's, it's our data. But at the same time, I think thoughtful curation of policies uh, and regulation is going to be absolutely essential so that uh, this is not completely a, a loss. So I might not have answered your question, but I think uh, what we are going to see, not only in the new administration, but also the collaboration between US and European Commission is going to be more intentional uh, evolution of GDPR privacy laws uh, so that, again, the consumers, as well as the service providers, both take ownership as to not only where this data is coming from, the provenance of that data, and giving the power back to the customers to say when, when the companies can or cannot use their data. Yeah, uh, we have, uh, I'm going to move on to um, uh, some of the questions from the audience. But before I do, do we have uh, any uh, further comment on, on that, uh, that conversation? That's a big one. I just offer one last thought, is that, and that is that that so much of what we said will pivot on um, a turn on the Commission, European Commission's appetite for antitrust action against Amazon, right? So everything, everything that we've said, if 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 there is a move in that direction, um, will will shape quite significantly what's possible, what's imaginable. It'll affect some of the scaling effects that we've talked about, and and I think it's another year, nine months, perhaps. Others on the call would have a better time sense of when when decisions will be taken, but that's that's still a possibility for us, right? Indeed. Um, so we have um, some good questions uh, that have come in from the audience that I want, I want to pick up, and um, uh, they they pertain to much of what we've already talked about, actually. But um, circling back on on some of these topics, um, this is an open question for the panel. But but uh, Ernestine, we'll start with you in a second. Um, it seems all these companies need to innovate to remain competitive and grow. Does the panel think the speed of investment will continue to expand and increase post pandemic? And if so, what does that mean for um, global competition between companies in the US and elsewhere around the world? Um, yeah, no, I think, I think that's a great question. I think um, the role of corporates um, is really interesting. Um, if I just look at, for instance, who the global tech giants are today, most of them are based in either the US or China. If I look at Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, um, Alibaba, Tencent, for instance. And I think um, a lot of, and Phil, I'd be curious since you're, you're the European panelist on here, but I think um, even looking at that, I think a lot of the European companies are realizing that and um, recognizing that they're a little bit at a disadvantage when it comes to um, um, having a path uh, to mass adoption of AI within Europe. Um, so really increasing investments on that front. Um, at the same time, 
if I look at, um, for instance, venture capital being really perfected in Silicon Valley and the US and that being a path to a lot of new innovative companies emerging over the last few years, I think all around the world, people are recognizing that and um, deciding to try to replicate and have similar um, VC models. I think overall, um, probably the main consideration in mind is that I think we've gotten to a point in which AI is widely recognized as the future of software. And as a result, that's um, resulting in increasing investments all around the world on that front. Very good. Jeff, do you have a, a comment on that question? I was, about to say, I was just replying because I really like Ernestine's uh, comment there. AI is the future of software. Is, is I think that I'm going to steal that from you if you don't mind. Um, no, I, I, it's really interesting. Coming out of a pandemic, I think, was the framing of the question. And if you look back um, through some other of the pandemics that we've had, you know, so the, the, the terminology used to describe the period of time after pandemic, you know, one of them, you go way back as the Renaissance, the other one is the Roaring Twenties, right? So we are seeing, you know, this is broader than, than the topic is covered. We are seeing signals that coming out of this is a lot of pent up demand that could really drive an expansive growth time. So from that alone, I could see um, a significant investment in, again, the digital digitization of companies and therefore AI as probably the driver, you know, as the AI is the software of the future, right? So I think that you're going to see this coming out of it driven as much by that as, as, as anything else. Um, so the dollars and volume of dollars, I think will be impressive. The other thing I think may be interesting because we're on an Asia society call is that that might be different, obviously in the different regions of the world. The fact is, is our offices in China actually never really shut, right? And, and, and they, you know, so they're still going and humming along. So, you know, they may not see as much of a growth of this, but, um, mm -hmm. They, they've been sort of humming along the whole time. Whereas in the West, I think you're gonna see this pent up sort of uptick um, if, if the economic indicators um, end up being true. Sure, and, and Phil, I wonder if, um, if, if you would echo that um, from the other side of the pond. Well, I think I, I totally buy the argument that um, Europe is, it's hard to, hard to identify the large large firms that are leaking in an AI, or it's hard for me to identify them right now. I would say that there's um, at least a, a number of German technology experts self say that the, um, the expertise they have in robotics and machine learning as it applies to um, new modes of designing the robots that other firms then use to implement on production lines, that that might be some level of specialization that really just lasts in the UK or really just lives in the UK or just lives in Germany. I'm not enough an expert to know if that's true, um, but it does seem that uh, on the other hand, the significant one of the significant markets for AI applications is still Europe. So even if, even if, this, uh, even if the centers of innovation are in China uh, or are in Silicon Valley, um, when the commission decides to act, decides to regulate, um, industries adjust. And um, I think they have that power, that, that market clout, customer clout, that may need to be reckoned with at some level. Yeah, and uh, there's one more question that I, I want to get to because I'm, I, uh, you know, as a journalist, they tell you, um, uh, don't ask questions if you don't already know the answer. Um, but I don't know the answer to this question. I'm really curious about it. Um, and Navreen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you. We, we, we can uh, work across here. This will, this will be our last question. Um, the question that came in, what industry will be the next to experience a substantial AI impacted revolution? And I, I like the question, I appreciate it, but I, I wonder if it's sort of the wrong question. Uh, this, this is just coming from me, so feel free to disabuse me of this notion. One of the things that we've been observing is how embedded AI is becoming um, in so many things, in so many industries. It's, you know, it's, it reminds me of Web 2.0. We were, people were talking about it as if it was a, a new thing and it was like, it's already here. You're already using it. Your email is already Web 2.0 and on and on. It seems to me that we're at, at a similar point with AI. People understand the interact with it every single day. Um, and I, I, I dare say that pretty much every industry has been affected by it already. Um, so, so maybe we're dodging the question and asking a different one, but um, you know, is there an industry that's sort of primed to sort of explode from, um, from the impact of AI, or or is it are we at the point where AI is becoming so infused that it's that's maybe the wrong question? 
So Naveen, we'll st start with you. I'm, I'm curious for your perspective on that. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I see it as two core things. When a technology becomes so pervasive that you don't even realize it's powering so much of your life. And that's what is happening with machine learning, but not at the scale that we would expect. So, you know, when you pick up your cell phone uh, and, and or you watch Netflix or go to Amazon, all that is already getting powered by some form of machine learning. Um, the, the thing that I like to think about is we are going to see this mass movement from pilot to scale. We have been sort of in this pilot phase for, you know, anywhere from five to six years. You know, while I was at Microsoft, we saw this extensively with our enterprise customers that they were still experimenting. They were still trying to figure out, is there a financial outcome, cost optimization or new top line generation that we can get from, from machine learning? And then the past year and a half, because of the focus, it sort of forced them into a situation they had to use uh, more, maybe not as sophisticated machine learning models, but at least they had to start using it. And that has sort of now brought from that focus a level of confidence that they can actually move from pilot to scale. So, you know, for me, um, I, you know, I love the notion of roaring 20s and, and every, all the renaissance that has happened. And I do think that we are going to see this renegade uh, age where organizations are going to sort of give up on their older beliefs and realize that digitization is important. Machine learning is going to power most of their operations. And these renegade organizations are going to now start moving into massive scale AI applications and also start thinking about AI governance and auditability. So it's already there. I think the focus is going to be from experimentation to intentional scaling. That's great. Uh, we have, um, I'm gonna, we'll do a lightning round here for the rest of this question, about 30 seconds uh, for each of you and then, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, but it Jeff looks like you're, you're ready to go. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm eager to I'll do I'll do my lightning round part of this. So um, I would say that it's it's less sector driven or industry and by industry driven, but a bit of the uh, maybe the have and the have nots or the separation time for companies right now within sectors and industries. We've already seen these examples. I can't name the claims of the companies because we serve all these companies, but you see it in uh, video streaming and, you know, services and, and who's really doing well versus who's doing fine, right? And you see it in financial services, like who's really explosively grown their AUMs versus sort of who has a traditional model. So I think this is separation time. And I think it's going to every industry, but what you'll see is that mix. Some of the, the leaders, whoever can reinvest, are going to, are going to pop up and the others are going to be okay. And, and, you know, clearly for those of you on the call, you want to be the ones that are moving up. Yeah. Uh, Phil, 30 seconds. Um, I, think of, I think of government as an industry. And I, I mean, I know that isn't quite the right turn of phrase, but, um, you know, when some of these public, public bureaucracies decide to make their machine learning investments, they will be large and significant. If an entire nation's healthcare system decides to do an upgrade, um, and, and many governments don't have their procurement systems ready. They're, they're not ready for, for, for making those large acquisitions, but they have a year or two to get there. And so I think those, those major public investments in AI are, are the next, are one of the important big waves of, um, that'll actually drive some innovation. Great, and, and Ernestine, if you give us the last word. Um, sounds good. So Seth, I definitely agree with you in terms of, I really do think AI has touched pretty much every single industry, finance, fraud detection, fitness, you know, recommendations from your personal trainer, AI personal trainer, shopping recommendations and whatnot. And I think at the end of the day, if we go back to the definition of AI and just the basic idea that there's um, any sort of computer device that can perform tasks that are commonly associated with intelligent beings. And if you just look around the world, you, you kind of see that happening and um, that's AI in our everyday lives, so. Wonderful. Well, uh, um, thanks to uh, all of our panelists for being here. We appreciate your insight uh, from, from various corners of the world and from AI that you brought to us. Um, and thanks to the Asia Society for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and, and, uh, and learn a little more. Um, we hope uh, all, everyone in the audience has learned something today. Um, and I believe this will be available later for, for future consumption. Um, and, and thanks EY for collaborating with Asia Society on this. Uh, thanks everybody, it was great speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you.